Hi, everyone. Welcome. I'm just going to give it a few minutes for people to come in and we'll get started. Okay, it looks like we have everyone that wanted to join right away in and welcome if you arrive late, although they don't know that because they haven't gotten here yet. Okay, welcome everyone. My name is Janet Forrest. I'm one of the adult uh, program coordinators at the Nantucket Athenaeum. I'm here along with my colleagues, Amy Janess and Daniel Griffin, um, who are in the background, but they may pop in at some point. Um, just to give you a uh, lay of the land, um, we're gonna make this a discussion. So I'm gonna welcome you to comment or ask questions at any point during the program. We're gonna go for about an hour. Um, if you have comments or thoughts, I'm gonna ask that you put that in chat. Um, if you have a specific question for anyone here tonight, um, I'm gonna ask that you put that in Q&A, but we'll be looking everywhere. So go ahead and just uh, pop it in if you have something to say. And if you're watching on YouTube, we are watching that. So you can go ahead and um, put it in the live chat on YouTube. So um, here we are. Tonight's uh, conversation is part of what uh, Daniel Griffin started, which is the Nantucket perspective. And tonight's conversation is racism and discrimination in the work island's workforce. Um, so before we begin, I'm going to ask each of the people here tonight to just briefly introduce themselves. I'm going to start with you, Moira. Hello all, Jeanette, Emmy, and Daniel. Thank you so much for putting this together and inviting me personally. I am very happy and honored to be part of this panelist. Uh, my name is Moira Lival. I have been on Nantucket for the past 20 plus years. I, um, I work in different line on Nantucket from corporate to mental health to now private practice full time. I own Moira Holistic Wellness, which is at Fort Bartlett Road where I provide counseling, mental health counseling uh, specifically, uh, life coaching, uh, functional medicine where it's mostly about uh, taking care of yourself from wood cause and thermography services where I provide information on your body on how to go to the next level. So I'm here on island as a, I work in finance uh, in the past bank. I work for years as with the nonprofit organization on Nantucket for almost a decade. I um, also an author of two best-selling books, uh, speaker, Nantucket, many other places on in off island and in other places and cities and town. I provide support in all way I can about, can about mindset and wellness. That's my main focus right now. And um, I'm here in the community to answer questions and to serve. And I'm extremely happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks, Myra. Uh, Charity, would you go next? Hi, uh, I'm Charity Grace Moffson. Um, thank you for inviting me. Thank you all for, for being here and for seeing the importance in this. Um, I am a photographer. I also currently work for the town. I've worked for a couple of different nonprofits um, on the island since moving here uh, about five years ago. So still uh, pretty new, but uh, this is home now. So um, from the beginning, just tried to get involved as much as possible. 
um, trying, still trying to meet as many of our neighbors as possible. Uh, for a small island, uh, we, we still have a lot of people here, so I think I still have a bit of work to do. Um, but yeah, just happy to be here. Thanks. Cavell? Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Cavell Madison. I'm originally from Jamaica. I've been living here for 20 years. I am the hospitality queen, as most people like to say it. <laughs> I'm currently the house manager of the Westmore Club. I've worked with a few um, hotels, um, especially in Nantucket Island Resorts. I've worked with Sustainable Nantucket. I'm excited to be a part of this panel. And as Grace said, you know, just continue to meet a lot more people, especially since COVID. It has been a different level of friendship, which I'm embracing. Great, thanks. Um, so I wasn't exactly sure where to begin. And as I said, before we went live, this can go wherever it goes. So by all means, jump in. But something I was thinking about is there's kind of different areas of it when we think of employment. So there's the outreach and recruitment piece. There's the hiring piece, and then there's um, elevation of promotion. So the, the growth through leadership within an organization. And I just wanted to put it out there of where, um, I guess looking here on Nantucket, where do you see discrimination showing up in those different areas? Yes, Cavell. Discrimination um, is something that I've seen in the workforce. It is very prevalent. Um, it's been a black single um, female, especially an immigrant. It is pretty obvious. I see where the promotion has been passed over for someone who is less qualified, but because of their skin tone. So there's a lot of racism in the workplace. There's classism, there's prejudice. and it's pretty prevalent here in Nantucket. A lot of people don't speak about it. And also the way it's done, it's done in um, a sort of a subtle way, but your eyes are open to what um, racism looks like, then you definitely are aware of that going on. And if you do a little survey, a lot of people will tell you that, yes. I've been working for this company for X amount of years and I definitely work hard, but I've been passed over because of my race and my class. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think to piggyback a little bit more on what Cavell and Charity started, uh, discrimination in the workplace on Nantucket, it's being done in a way that you have to be smart enough to detect it because you are giving just enough to not talk about it. So as you know, as being a professional in some aspect of your life, you're able to see it, but there's a best way you being provided either with um, a raise to keep you content mm -hmm. or to just making sure you know you are not going to the top because we have an assumption you are not good enough. Mm -hmm. So therefore giving you raise to just keep you here with us will make you sh feel you just blessed to be here. Mm -hmm. Because I'm blessed to be here, therefore I'm keeping it down. I'm keeping the tone. I'm maintaining the status quo and I'm not going to dare talking about it mm -hmm. because I'm privileged to be here. Mm -hmm. But I'm privileged to staying low, low enough, so people appreciate me. So I feel over the years working on Nantucket, uh, and when you take in general survey of what's going on around the world, there is an assumption that based on the color of your skin, 
There are positions you do not apply for that you do not qualify for from the get go. Mm -hmm. So if you're there to do that, oh, what makes you think you really will be able to do that? The prejudice of thinking like, you know you're not gonna get this because, because you condition to some degree, to some level to know this is not for you. Don't go there. So that's to add a little bit more on what you said, Carmel. Mm -hmm. I just wanna add on that too. Um, I, I think the issue um, from what I've experienced and, and it, you know, just kind of piggybacking on what Moira was saying as well, it's, there's obviously an issue within the workplace, but also because of our own conditioning, uh, um, believing that, that you're not qualified for a position uh, because of what you've seen before, because of, uh, you know, who you've seen in those positions. Uh, um, I think that that's, that's a big issue as well. Uh, not only for us, you know, those of us who are currently in the workforce, but as we look ahead, uh, uh, our young people that are going to be entering the workforce. That's one of the reasons why representation is so incredibly important. Um, making sure that we are seeing different faces, making sure that we're seeing who's in our community, <laughs> you know, actually working in, in a variety of, of positions around the island. Yeah. yeah, yeah, the ability to see someone, you know, like see a woman in the role, see an African American in the role, see an immigrant in that role. Yeah, seeing people that look like you and represent you, and like just being able to see it's possible. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, okay. Um, Mariah, uh, uh, Mariah Mitchell Association did a talk a few weeks ago. I don't know if anyone made it to that. It was great. And they um, focused specifically on people of color in the STEM fields and why there are so um, few people that either get elevated or even through the door. And one of the things they talked about is sort of what really, when you get down to it, it's arbitrary prerequisites and requirements. So they'll require like a certain degree or a certain, you know, normally you don't really need it or you could get it while they've already hired you and get it once you get there. And I, um, how might that show up here on Nantucket in different areas? I think when you think uh, about institutional, institutional racism in general, uh, and we think about the, all the requisite, the requirement to even as people of color to break into management position, it's already predetermined that you will not succeed. I feel this, it takes a lot of courage and strength to just go from that mindset over many in general that think you're not qualified to overcome that yourself and then also to just have the resources. You know, I, I look back and I see uh, slavery, how is it portrayed and how it is now and how we are being in slavery in a different form. And I say that in many ways, because when I am conditioned to work 60, 70 hours a week to make a living, and I don't have a lot of opportunities to enjoy life and to study, to do anything, I'm getting minimum wage. I am expected to do those kind of work so how am I going to be breaking into management position? First of all, I don't have the education, not because I don't want to, not because I'm not smart enough, but I don't have the opportunities. I am easily sick because I work so many hours. I don't have the opportunities of parent backing me up. I need to leave to go to school, but I don't have the money to pay for it. So you put enough conditions so I stay down. Mm -hmm. The opportunity that's supposed to be there for people to just expand instead of protect. 
-hmm. We tend to protect because we don't have any hope. Mm -hmm. And when we protect, we keep our safety net and the safety net maintain us in that slavery mindset, mm -hmm. but in a way that is very disguised, in a way that we're very compliant, in a way that we feel that we are doing good, but you are being controlled by the institution that's surrounding you. Mm -hmm. So it takes a lot of courage for a person of color and unique individualized like strength to break into overcome the expectation that people of color are already not good enough to be in certain position. So I will say this is where I stand on that in that aspect. Yeah, it's the two pieces. It's coming from the person applying, feeling psychologically strong enough and mentally strong enough to put themselves out there, knowing that there's these systems and places telling them not to do that. And it's like this mix of what's real and what's not real. Um, and you said something interesting about, you know, when you're working a, a minimum wage job and you're just getting by, and then it's like, you don't have the extra energy and the resources to even take a day off or what, or do night classes or, or, you know, um, gym membership, like all these things that will give you the energy and the mindset to explore and have the extra, extra energy to move forward when you're just hanging on. Yeah, it's very, very difficult to promote some real advancement when you don't have the skill and you don't have ways to, and I meet so many great people on island. They want to go to school. They want to pursue some dream. And you know, Latino and uh, 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 whole of color, black, but they can't because they have the rent to pay. They have the family abroad to, to support. So it's make it very difficult. Promoting diversity is not what I'm seeing on finding people with strength to elevate it's just mm -hmm. keeping people in a place where you know uh you can't do this no don't even go there you're not going to get that promotion mm -hmm. and well, that's my opinion yeah yeah um what kind of changes would would we see on island if there were more people of color in leadership roles like if it was really open to people of anyone to feel that sense of equality when they're applying for the job, they know they'll be treated than no other candidate. Um, and we see more people of color in management roles, executive director roles, um, people really that make decisions on how the money's spent and who gets hired. What, um, I guess, what greater impacts would that have for the island, do you think? I think just in general, it would be much more holistic. Mm -hmm. um, you have more people at the table. You've got more people involved in, in decision-making, more people that actually represent the island. Um, only good can come from that, you know? Um, even the discussions that we're having right now, you know, this handful of us, we could come up with all sorts of ideas, but just imagine when you have more people involved, things that wouldn't have necessarily crossed your mind uh, if you have that person at the table. Uh, now, now you have this additional voice that maybe, maybe you would have never thought about before. So, um, I think just on a very basic level, um, we have the opportunity to know what we don't know. Um, yeah, yeah. Something I think a lot about is, um, and I don't know, but it wasn't until you know, women were in elected positions at the Capitol that they were like, we should have bathrooms for women. <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's all these blind spots you don't think about until someone like is like, by the way, um, this is kind of necessary. I'm gonna jump into the questions right now. Um, we have a few. Uh, so this is from uh, Kat Robinson Greeter. How can employers attract more diverse workforce and support them once they're hired? Um, would anyone like to take that one? Um, can you repeat the question? How can? Um, how can employers attract a more diverse workforce and support them once they're hired? 
I think, first of all, the consciousness work has to be done. You can't start. You can't start hiring people of color when you consciously hold so much, so many bias. Mm -hmm. You start doing the work. You start, Janet. You put this together with the Ateneo, Amy, and Daniel. You start questioning. You start talking about it. You start looking at what is it really the diversity in my community? How is it my community within my own? business is being represented mm -hmm. and going from the basic and then now you start checking there are so many very good qualified people of color on island they are not given opportunities they are not being seen because of what we just talked about the institutional racism that is exists discrimination, knowing that you're not good enough. I love the law of, uh, uh, their logic of Pygmalion. If you think someone, you subconsciously expect someone to succeed, mm -hmm. you will put in place measures, things for them to succeed. But if you also think the contrary, it shall happen as well. Mm -hmm. So it's understanding in order for this to happen, to start getting employee to your door, you need to start educating yourself that we people of color are not defined by our color, the color of our skin, but also by our intelligence that you have no clue about, but you're already presumptuously thinking we are not capable because we are of color. Mm -hmm. So eradicate this assumption is the first. Now start doing the job to find out people that went to school, that's educated, and then give them a chance and let them perform. Don't set them up for failure because usually you set me up, you put me there and you said, I know you're going to fail the logic we just discussed. So now I feel that expectation, you meet your need because you know I'm going to fall. You said, that's what I don't like to hire people of color. But you set everything up for me mm -hmm. to fail. Mm -hmm. Contrary, you're more tolerant toward the other people that show up. Mm -hmm. You allow them to just arrange for the babysitter. You allow them to show up at a time that is convenient, but they do the job, they stay late. Mm -hmm. You give me opportunity to make things happen because I know to even go to your question prior, with two minds, we see bigger. Mm -hmm. We're not seeing front of us, we're seeing a bigger, the dimension become more diverse. So I'm seeing things you're not seeing and I'm bringing it and you're validating them you don't have to take it all on you, but you give the opportunity to bring ideas and take them into consideration. One thing I was just gonna add to that, you know, doing the work first, you know, why, why would people of color wanna work at your particular, you know, organization or company, you know, make it a place that is once we get there, you know, is, is it a healthy environment? You know, is it a positive environment? Um, but also I think another important thing to remember is the same way it wouldn't be or, or shouldn't be uh, socially acceptable to just be like, you know, I need a black friend. Like, let me go out and find a black person to be my friend. Uh, <laughs> the same thing in the workforce. Um, it's not gonna be easy changing things. It's not gonna happen overnight. But to think that in order to fix things, if you just go out and hire a black person that, let me check the box now, I did the thing. Um, that's not how it works. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a level of like, just being honest with yourself, with your coworkers in your organization of like, what? yeah, what's the work we need to do? Where are we failing? And being like, this is what we're trying to, I mean, I know that's kind of the journey of the, the names on right now of like, okay, what do we, let's start here. 
Um, we're not, we're looking around being like, okay, we have some work to do. Um, yeah, for sure. For sure. And making sure that um, it's not a token hire. It's not something to make the people in the building feel better. It's, it's becoming part of who you are, part of your identity, part of your organization. Yeah. I just want to touch base, just going back to the question of STEM, because I'm sure some people are wondering what is STEM. It's science, technology, engineering, and math which has now been exchanged to STEAM. But let's talk about people of color. I work at a country club and I see all these beautiful, well-toned, educated white women playing tennis, croquet, all those wonderful games and their kids are off. There's not one black person because guess what? We don't get to be a part of STEAM because we can't explore the arts, we can't explore dance, we can't explore drama because we're too busy working, we're hustling. So therefore, these people continue that whole generation of this country club, they're going to excel. Meanwhile, who's catering to them? Mm -hmm. Someone of color, that person who is probably trying to be a part of STEM because STEAM is too much. And I'm glad you brought that to my attention. I was in a, having a discussion with one of my employees who's white and she's like, STEM is now STEAM, but there's so many people who can't even be a part of STEM because they can't afford education. So that is a very broad um, subject. There's STEAM versus STEM. We cannot afford to be a part of STEM because systematically black people most black people are very poor. We can't afford to get an education. We can't afford to um, explore the arts. Mm -hmm. Would we want to be dancers and all that, um, all those wonderful things? Absolutely, but we just cannot because we're busy taking care of our siblings or trying to survive. In, so how do we move from surviving to thriving? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm going to get to a couple more questions we have. Um, in what ways do you see the pandemic exasperating racism on the island? I would say, um, you know, in, in very similar ways that you see on the mainland, you know, <clears throat> statistically speaking, a lot of times people of color are, are in uh, positions, you know, employment positions where they're, they're on the front lines, you know, uh, where they're considered essential. Uh, so, you know, being forced to continue to work during a pandemic or being in a position where you can't work during the pandemic. So now you're out of work uh, um, and, and all of the challenges that come along with that. Uh, we could talk about the the health statistics, you know, and and the numbers uh, with regards to the fact that people of color, uh, statistically, it's shown that we are at a greater risk uh, for COVID nineteen. Uh, so these are all issues that you know I feel like are are very real to to many of us. Uh, whether or not these are conversations that that are taking place within the workplace. Um, probably depends on the the organization or, or business um but definitely conversations that need to be had it's it's we're talking about people's lives mm -hmm. and livelihoods yeah uh to add to this janet i face firsthand this pandemic with people of color it's sad i have had and i can't tell you how many how many calls that I have received during the pandemic because when I first heard about the pandemic, first I opened my practice full time in January. Uh, COVID-19 hit first, second week of March. I had to close. I am not qualified for unemployment because I have a business. <laughs> right there, it's just rolling and I'm, I don't have any, any income. 
I don't qualify for the small business loan because I just started. I don't have length enough mm -hmm. to show that I was, <laughs> I have a history. And uh, here I am, I'm facing my bills and every day. So I have to leave, I have to eat. Well, I'm creative, thanks God. But what called my attention is when I started offering my support to hundreds on island. I said, okay, Moira, you have time, offer free service. Free people, mental health, everybody going, going to be affected. I said, anyone that have problem, call me. I offer you 30 minutes free of services. Mm -hmm. I receive dozens of calls every day, mostly people of color and Latino. They don't have a job. They can't go to work. They are not qualified very often for the money that they're supposed to. Some of them don't, I'm not blaming anything, but some of them don't pay taxes on time. Some of them did, don't have a lot of the status to get the $1,200 that was being offered. And, or some of them made enough money based on income on Nantucket, you're not qualified Mm -hmm. for that, uh, this $1,200 the government was providing. So a lot of people on the internet, you might think that have that income, they didn't receive it. So here people saying for three, four, five months, expecting job to open with no expectation how they going to pay their bill, how they going to eat. I partner and volunteer to a lot of places, food pantry, anyone that I knew that could help. I had a lot of people reach out to me and gave me even some uh, you know, gift card to just give to people. But I'm saying this was so harsh on people on island that have no, remember most people work 60, 70 hours a week, 60 hours, 50 hours. And as uh, Charity said, they are the first line of defense. Mm -hmm. So they work in people, people's house. When you shut it down, basically they have to stay home. Staying home one, two weeks, one or two weeks for someone of color that depend, all my paycheck is a weekly basis to pay my bill, get grocery, and then also support some of my family members that are abroad. That's the reality that I have seen on island. So people are still struggling. Just so you know, there are people that still are hiring, but they don't hire the full scale. Their places, their restaurant, their, their thing are not open full scale. So they hire a portion mm -hmm. or they give you 50 hours, 40 hours, 30 hours. But guess what's happening right now? We have another pandemic coming. Mm -hmm. Because all these people that used to work full time for the summer, to make money to cover for the winter. They are mm -hmm. having anxiety now to know how am I going to pay my bill? Because now they already started to click right now. I don't have enough money for the next two months. So now I have a four month, months, four or five months to pay. So the, 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 the issue is real here. The discrimination as you, how you put it, the lack of awareness of there are people on this island that are living paycheck to paycheck day to day when they do one job that's what they feed their children and you know right now there is a real issue that I'm seeing here as a mental health professional and you wonder how to help and then you keep on asking and I'm glad this question comes because it's still here it's not gone it's affected the population huge way and it continue and it will continue. Mm -hmm. Well, and that goes back to what you had said initially about elevation and leadership in a position, because if you're always at the bottom, even if, even if you go from say like $18 an hour to $20 an hour, what's that $2 when you're still daily, you don't get paid time off, you don't get vacation, you don't get sick yeah. days and you're required to work, like you're still on that razor's edge. So there's no cushion that when something happens, um, and when we look at the demographics of who's filling those positions here on Nantucket and nationwide, it goes back to when you don't have the possibility of pr pr promotion, you're just, oh, you're stuck at that place of vulnerability. You are stuck, totally stuck. And then that's what 
with you saying, Charity, this is what's going on. Yeah. It's a cycle that continues to keep you in a line of less than. Mm -hmm. And it's become your life. It becomes your norm mm -hmm. to just, I'm less than. I have to work 80 hours. I need to find a job. I need to find another opportunity. But it's just to survive. That's mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why I think that opportunities for professional development are so important. There's only so much that an individual can do on their own when they're already in the type of situations that we've just described. Mm -hmm. uh, so businesses, organizations that are serious about doing the real work, that are serious about truly diversifying their, their business, they need to look at professional development and, and, and be willing to invest in their people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, we have another question. I'm not exactly sure what this refers to, so we might have to get back to it, but it says, do you believe that is the same reason why there are not more people of color in the field of education? I'm trying to think what that would have referred to. Um, I will think briefly, it's just maybe yeah. just to the same as we were talking about the education, uh, mm -hmm. to be in the field of education, it's just not like that. You need a lot of study. You need a lot of time to prepare. You need, you know, those CEUs. You need consistent improvement and all of that. You can't go. And I think if you think about it, uh, Janet, it will be so empowering living in on an island where we export most of our, we import more of our uh, labor. Mm -hmm from other side and then when people start leaving you start being in panic who's gonna do this job i remember even coming you coming on island to work at the ateneum for me it was such a big fresh when i talked to you i said i am here and i'm here to stay i'm like yes i'm like excited i'm like thinking, anybody that i know that's here to stay i'm like excited because i love to hear this good professional year-round living on Nantucket, you know, housing is expensive. Like, you know, as soon as you said, I'm staying, I'm like, okay, God, I now I start praying for her to find good housing <laughs> so, <laughs> to keep her. So there is a, a, that constant to be in education, you have to be educated. To be educated, you have to have time and money. And to have time and money, you have to have the resources. If the resources are not here, then you don't go. There are a lot of people that want to do, you know, do another level so they can't i have know a lot of people that you know that don't speak a lot of english you know people latino because they don't have the time to put into going to study and the basic and they can't get to education but if we favor some of those guess what we will have great i see a generation of students that graduate from the time i started working with them as mental health professionals they are in the workforce right now. And that's like, I, I'm so excited to see that mm -hmm. because they leave, they went to the university and they come back mm -hmm. on Nantucket and now are working on Nantucket where you know the families are here. They're gonna stay for a while, hopefully. So yeah, I would say that, that, that the part that difficult for in general with me for people to be in education. Yeah. Um, okay, we have another question. How does housing affect what jobs you can take? Are jobs that provide housing as available to non-white workers at the same rate as they are available to white workers? Are jobs that offer housing as good jobs, um, as good as jobs that require you to find your own housing? So there's a lot in there, but I can read it again if you want. <laughs> yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> okay, so there's three questions. Um, how does housing affect what jobs you can take? Are jobs that provide housing as available to non-white workers at the same rate as they are available to white workers? And um, finally, are jobs that offer housing as good as jobs that require you to find your own housing? Uh, I feel if anybody wants to answer first, they can go, or you want me to go? <laughs> um. Just because I've been in employee housing, I can certainly speak to that. 
And strangely enough, that three part question is a simple question for me. One, um, housing. Housing can be tricky. Um, housing, the statistics has changed over the years. I remember when I first came here, we got new housing and it was all for Jamaicans. It didn't matter what level um, you were working, whether you were bar back or your manager, the housing was just there for us to enjoy, which I can, I have to say personally, I've never had any horrible housing experience here, knock on wood. <laughs> I've been so grateful. The second housing that I lived in, I was recommended by someone and they didn't even try to find out who I was. She's like, I hear you're great. You have an excellent um, preference. I want to have you stay at my housing in Nashiquiset in the farmhouse. Same thing with where I live, my landlord is like, okay, you seem to be a great person. So I've never had that issue, but back to housing. So there's something tricky about housing. If you're an empl in, in employee housing, mm -hmm. it's kind of like a ball and un it's kind of like a ball and chain. <laughs> if you're an employee housing, you have to adhere to their rules. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, yes, if you are a Caucasian person, you definitely will get the better housing. The rules will be more relaxed versus someone who is, and note this, not only black, but just from a different country. Cause I've seen where my European friends get very crappy housing and it's because they're not Americans. So housing definitely can affect the position that you're in because if you're in on the higher totem, Pole, then you're definitely going to get better housing versus someone who is, you know, a frontline worker or in, in the non-managerial position. Yeah, def housing can definitely affect you. But I think with the lack of housing over the years, that has kind of changed in a good way. So it's just like first come, first serve. First come, first serve. Yeah. Um, I have a question that someone texted to me because they couldn't... Uh... Uh, find their way in. Um, they're wondering how we can support and cultivate cultural resources for Nantucket's community of color. And that goes back to, I think, kind of what Cavell said about it's no longer STEM, it's STEAM. So um, can anyone comment on how we can support and cultivate cultural resources for Nantucket's community of color? Get to know, get to know your neighbor. It's simple as that. Hello. <laughs> You're Cavell. Nice to meet you. Where are you from? I'm from Jamaica. Tell me something about your culture. Mm -hmm. When you see Charity, don't instantly assume that she is from Mississippi or somewhere or that she's not educated. Or when you see Mara, don't assume that because she has an accent, she's not educated. Get to know. Ask those questions. Ask those, oh, those questions. Who are you? Tell me about your national dish. When I see someone, I'm like, tell me something about your country or let me ask about your behavior. Why do you seem so straight? Don't assume. Just ask those questions. It's simple. Janet, when you walk up to me and you're like, hey, I'm Janet. <laughs> and it was simple as that. Here we are. Years to come, you know, because of Janet, I can actually do public speaking. And Janet didn't assume that, hey, this girl won. She's like, I want you to come. She was persistent because she was invested in the relationship and also in my development. So people have to want to know and care to know. I had someone come into the um, club and they're like, oh my God, you're from Jamaica? We're sent. He was so excited. So you have to have that excitement just about with anything. You have to want to know. Like Maura said, you have to have that consciousness. You have to want to know. So it's simple as that. There is no hard, no, no black and white or any trick to it. Just curiosity. Yeah. And that goes a little bit back to what Charity said of just create, you know, creating th something that's more organic, not like, okay, how do I fill out? I need a Latina friend. I need a black friend. I mean, it's like, it's more yeah. than that. It's just going out and getting curious of like, oh, this person seems different for me. What's, what's their deal? I'm going to ask a few questions. Yeah. 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 Um, we have a comment from YouTube uh, from a Bethany 
Um, she said, I'm sorry that you were in a place of feeling like you didn't have finances for education, Moira. Um, but in regards to Cavell's white privilege um, country club issue, uh, I'm wondering how you feel about the Nantucket Golf Club just awarding, oh, I think there's a mix up here, but um, they're wondering um, how you feel about the Nantucket Golf Club um, awarding your daughter the scholarship. Um, congratulations again um, to the College of Her Choice based on your own, based on her own merits. Okay, first to clarify, I always had the finances to pay for education. That's not ever been an issue for me, thanks God. Believe in God and that have never been an issue. I came to Nantucket where I had already three degrees. I speak six languages. So even just to just speak and translate, I would have a job anywhere. So I knew that. So education for me was always a priority. Came in from Costa Rica, I had a degree in finance and banking. I had the language skills and I was teaching. I traveled Europe teaching as a background graduate from La Sorbonne University teaching French. So I had already prepared because my parents always believe in education. So this is something that I'm talking in general, not specifically related to me. So thank you for mentioning it, but that's not apply in specific to me. For the scholarship that my daughter actually was awarded, I feel that's a huge blessing and I am extremely grateful to the Nantucket Golf Club. I'm extremely grateful to the community. I feel not only it's provide me a boost because to start with, even if I had to sell a kidney, my daughter will go to college. This is not, this is, this is where I come from. You know what I mean? So this is my, my, the same my parents, they weren't really in college, but they made sure. I have five, six brothers and sisters. They all went to college, all graduate, all good background, but because my parents believe in that. So I believe in that. Our you know, family, but I am one of those of many that do not have those opportunities. And if I think about me, I'm removing myself from this crowd because to say, I want more opportunity for every black man, every uh, man, woman of color, young man of colors, Latino that I have worked with. There is an expectation that you are this color and it's actually very interesting because I even went to meetings. They are gearing most of black and people of colors in general to just go in the field. I'll like, you know, those work that where you're not going to spend four years, five years going to further yourself. So I've seen that firsthand happening where the comments, it's like, let we know they finish high school. Let's make sure they graduate. So at least they have their diploma. At least they have their diploma. So this in general for me, it's a huge privilege. It's a huge, huge gift. I feel so blessed by the blessing of this community. She works her butt off. That's no, no, no secret. In my family, you work to get what you want in your life. But what I'm coming from, where I'm coming from is that to overcome the expectation of what people subconsciously have of people of color in general, it takes a lot of strength. And a lot of people based on their background coming from a family that do not have the level of education or empowerment or belief system that you can do it, usually it doesn't happen. So if I'm going to put myself in a place, I will say I'm one of the privileged of the underprivileged. And that doesn't make me comfortable because I know so many people out there that's also capable and the children stay, don't go to college because they don't have the fund. All the kids want to, 
but they know the parent will not be able to support them. So from the get go, they said, I'm not going any further because I know my mom not going to have their money, single parents. I know my dad not going to be helping. I know my dad not going to have the money. So I'm already going to the workforce, making just basic to survive. I have kid that I feel devastated. They started so strong and you know, they go to college the first year and second year, they can't keep up and they, I see them coming back. I am sad and I wish in my life, I said, what if I could create a fund and support those, what if I can create partnership with some of those colleges to say, can you mentor one? Can you pick one? Can we create something on Nantucket where we can mentor some of the kids in, those com in this community? I'll be the first one to say, I'm putting some money in it. It doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. I am willing. But if we all combine together, if every four years, you know, like the Nantucket golf clubs do, you know, if you put 20, 30, 50, 60 hands together, there's a lot that can be achieved. So I'm saying, as Nantucket Golf Club did, what if we all can group and all those big businesses on Nantucket partner with the school, with other kids and say, let's make our community people of color mm -hmm. the best they can be because they have opportunities now. Let's see if none of them will take it. Yeah. Yeah. There's actually another part to that question. Um, they were wondering, does your daughter share your views of racism and oppression on Nantucket? Oh, she's a huge advocate for that. She has witnesses. She was bullied in school. Mm -hmm. and, but, you know, she overcome that because I am behind, because I'm always there. My husband is always there. We are there. But she's a huge advocate for racism, people suffering from all kinds of racism. And if you tell her, go jump and fly a kite with, because someone just being touched by racism, she will jump without, I'm have to say, hey, wait, let's talk about it first to know they're all the part. But this is, she's huge and she loved to talk to people, you know, work on them, but with them. And she has her old followers and she will advocate, she will do things. And you have seen her is give her speech uh, with the last event in town. She's a strong believer of protecting people of color in any way she can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, okay, we have another question. We're getting close to time. Um, so I'll put this in and then I'll ask for any more questions and final thoughts. Um, this is from Kaylee, more people are conversations, asking questions, and listening to people of color talk about their experiences with racism right now. Still, it can be an intimidating conversation for many white people to enter into. What do you think stops some people from having a conversation, and what would you say to those people? Um, I'm just going to say and I had this conversation with one of my employees is there are going to be those hard conversations because that's just natural. That's life. There are certain subjects that are hard to talk about, but you just have to find your angle, what works best for you and just finding whether it's social media or speaking face to face with someone. And I do understand there's certain subjects that are hard to really approach and you should not be judged because you're afraid to approach it, but you should at least attempt to have that conversation, but find the format that really works for you. That would be my suggestion. And I think adding to this, Jenna, it's a question of fear. You're not educated enough, so you don't know how to approach people of color. You have assumption in your head. If I say that, they will take it this way because they are Black. Don't have assumption about me, ask me a question. Mm -hmm. But also educate yourself. I'm not here to educate you. Yeah. Find out, there's tons of books. Go to Ateneum, call Janet. <laughs> Janet, I need some books about people of color. 
Don't come and investigate about me or everything you want to know about black. You know, I'm educating myself as well because, you know, I'm just trying to know what's going on. I'm not the savvy in that area. So when you want to ask questions, ask questions based on what you know. Don't ask questions based on your assumption. Mm -hmm. And it's so important to know, just the fear of asking from you, presume you have sometimes things in your head, you're not comfortable yeah. because you don't know. Yeah. You just have to question your own bias. Mm -hmm. What's in your head that you practicing that not helping you asking the question you need to ask yeah. and put it open. Ask somebody that you're closer with mm -hmm. and then you can expand it to other people and have their opinion. Mm -hmm. But be willing to listen because we ask questions with a question to answer already to protect and defend. Mm -hmm. Listen, if you ask me a question, are you willing to ask me a question and listen to me <laughs> and not judging me and not assuming like you saying that because mm -hmm. be willing to listen to me. It's my opinion. You ask me a question. It's my experience. Understand my cultural background. I'm not going to answer you the way Cavell from Jamaica answered. I'm not going to answer, you know, it's not going to be the way you think I'm going to answer. I'm going to answer based on my experience, based mm -hmm. on my trauma, based on my education, based on my background. Mm -hmm. So be open to, learn, to, to hear what I have to say without mm -hmm. judgment and just take it in. Charity? No, I mean, totally spot on, you know, you got to be willing to listen. Um, but also one of my favorite lines from one of my favorite books uh, that I pretty much recommend to everyone. Uh, so you want to talk about race? I'm sure you guys have it. <laughs> um, but she, the author of the book, she talks about how, like, you just need to get to the point that you accept the fact that you're going to mess up. Uh, you're gonna at some point you're probably gonna say something stupid uh, or or something that like you didn't know uh, uh, <laughs> you know you didn't know better um, there are ways to minimize uh, uh, the potential damage that you do and one of those ways is by educating yourself you know pick up a book uh, um, start look if it's actually important to you be willing to do the work you know but also be gentle with yourself and realize that this is, if we're gonna do this right, it's gonna be, we're doing something that hasn't been done before, you know? Uh, uh, and so we're, we all have to learn a bit. Um, so I think having some compassion for yourself and, and realizing that you're not gonna be a pro uh, uh, from the beginning, you know, none of us is, uh, um, but also realizing that this isn't going to be something that you can cheat at, you know, you can't take the easy way out and this. it will, it will come back, <laughs> you know, uh, um, but it's, it's worth doing the work. Yeah. I think I'm just going to say for all three of us, myself, Moira and Charity, we're very approachable. And if you see me with an RBA face, it's because I'm thinking about my veils or something. We're really approachable. Stop assuming that we need to walk around with a smile on our face like we're a Cheshire cat. We're women that are very um, involved in lots of things and we're multitasking in our head. So please don't assume CYA, check your assumption approach any one of us on the streets and get to know about us. Talk to us. We're going to have that conversation with you because we have to have those hard conversations. We have to defend ourselves every day. So we're ready. Come speak with us. Have a conversation with us, whether it's over coffee, whatever, and, and can say for all three ladies, we're approachable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Um, there was an interview I heard recently with Nicole Hannah Jones, who was spearheaded um, and won a Pulitzer for the 1619 project that came out last year. And um, she recently wrote an article in the New York Times and she was being interviewed about it, about reparations, um, which is always a controversial term. And what she was asked was, you know, how do you see that working? Like, how much money would it be and where would it work? And her response was, look, if we can put a man on the moon, we can come up with the calculus of what it is to fix it. The problem is <laughs> we need the will, like we need the intention, we need like the political and the cultural and the social uh, will to do something different. And when we can do that, we're all smart. Like we can fix things, we've fixed other things. Um, I mean, look at all the progress and the way this community's come together during COVID. We had no notice on that. And, it was just like, all right, fix it. So I think this, I mean, it's different, but I think when there's the will to do it differently and make change, um, I think that's a huge piece of it. But because I'm goal oriented, um, I just wanted to highlight a few things that we came out of this that just next steps to think about whether you're um, part of an organization, a leader of an organization. These are a few things I, I heard us talk about was um, finding the resources that are needed to free up energy for growth, whether that's um, figuring out um, health care, child care, um, resources for education, but being able to lift people up so they have that extra energy um, to grow their careers. Um, professional development offering that. So when people show up at a job and they're hired, they are set up for success. And, um, and getting to know your neighbor. Because when you already have a relationship, when you get to these more difficult and awkward and uncomfortable conversations, at least you have a cushion, you have um, a relationship to build off of, as opposed to just being perfect strangers and not knowing where people are coming from. Um, and with that, I'm just gonna oh, let each of you say any final thoughts you might have. Um, I guess we do have, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> Someone asked, so Charity, when are you free for coffee? <laughs> uh, uh, well, it's, it's uh, Darcy Creech. She said, thanks when are you to free COVID. For um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing this right here. So uh, <laughs> we can virtually uh, break bread or, or, or share a, a coffee. <laughs> but um, yeah, definitely still trying to interact with people as much as possible but as safely as possible. Darcy, I bet you can find her on Facebook. <laughs> but but uh, thank you, Darcy. Um, okay, so with that, I will go around. Um, Charity, why don't I start with you? Any final thoughts or comments? Um, no, I mean, just really happy to be here. Really happy that so many of us are willing to have these conversations now. Uh, um, it's it's crunch time, it's past crunch time. Mm -hmm. um, but I think um, in my lifetime, this is the first time that I feel like I have genuinely been hopeful uh, um, about the direction that we're heading in. Uh, um, in particular, living here on Nantucket, I'm incredibly hopeful with uh, uh, our community here. I think if, if ever it were possible anywhere, uh, um, to to create some real lasting change, I think we can definitely do it here. So I am um, I'm, I'm happy to to help out with that. Great, uh, Moira. Uh, thank you, Janet, so much for organizing uh, this event. Thank you for everyone. Thank you, everyone, for showing up to be willing to have those conversations. And this is a great start. I am extremely hopeful. And I think this Nantucket Strong, it's a great place to start to show how when you come with a consciousness that is change, how things can change from institutionalism, uh, institutional racism in general in our country. It's just very important to note from 1979 to 1989, there was a 200% increase of people of color 
involved in management position. Still, they were less than 2% in general in the country. Mm -hmm. So we have a way to go. We have a long road ahead of us. People of colors, they are open. Don't be afraid to ask questions, but also educate yourself. Be open to diversity. Be open to know your neighbor and give your neighbor a chance. You don't know me enough to come with assumption. Give me, your neighbor, your friends, a chance to become the best they can be. Mm -hmm. And that also support our community that also support the next generation that will be built in Nantucket. And that diversity will benefit uh, everyone in this community in overall. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would say. Thank you so much to all of you. And I'm glad to be here, Charity, with you. Haven't seen you for a while, Cavell. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much, all of you from the Nantucket Athenaeum for organizing such beautiful discussion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kavel, final thoughts? I just want to thank everyone for tuning in. I know everyone is busy. I really appreciate you investing an hour of your time. We really appreciate your thoughts and um, also listening to us. I just want to say I absolutely love this community. Mm -hmm. I'm a social butterfly, so just being a part of this conversation and trying to establish and educate what we go through as Black people and hopefully raise equality um, and the awareness and the impact of how it um, affects as the I'm just hoping that everyone will understand, not only just think about that one month that you celebrate, which is in February, but throughout the days and incorporated whatever they know, like how can I stand up for What can I contribute? And thanks for always coming programs for the people who don't really know what gender is one of the main things. Oh, Cabell, we're losing you a little bit. Oh, no. No. <laughs> uh, poor Cabell. Oh, she's oh, back. Oh, she's back. Sorry, Cabell. Um, finish up. Uh, if you can hear, are you there? Sorry. <laughs> okay. I think we can hear you. Try <laughs> Say your last last bit again. I was just saying, I just want to thank you for being one of those facilitators on this island who's always pr promoting um, self-awareness, um, self-education, and also teaching people how to be better at so many things speaking, whether it's racial inequality, just also just so you know that Jen also that is a mentorship a professional anyway, so. <laughs> I guess we'll end it there, but this is not the end. Um, I have some other thoughts and I welcome yours. I did put my email in chat. It's jforest at Nantucket Athenaeum. Uh, if anyone has any thoughts or comments, I also put the link to the Facebook event for tonight. So I know there were a couple other questions. Um, I'm sure people have comments or, you know, as they're thinking about this and sleeping on this, um, go ahead and put some comments there. We can keep the conversation going. Um, but thank you so much, Cavell, Moira, and Charity Grace for being here. I really appreciate your time and your candidness and openness. Um, and thank you for everyone that attended. Um, so this is the end of this conversation, but it, it will continue. So 
stay tuned. Have a great night, everyone. And this will be available if you want to watch it again on YouTube. So have a great night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>